Right, hi. Uh, I'm Marianne Talbot. You, quite a few of you know me, but there are a few new faces here, so I'm going to hope get to know your names very quickly. Uh, and some of your names I'm going to forget, and if I call you you or something like that, you'll just have to get used to it, I'm afraid. Um, we're being podcast, so welcome to everyone who's watching this on a podcast. Um, I, the, all the slides that I'm using are going to be available either in handout form or uh, with the podcast, so so you should be able to follow everything that I'm doing um, without needing to take copious notes. OK, let's get started. OK, in this session, um, we're going to be doing all these things. Uh, it's not going to take us too long to go through the first three. The last one may take a little bit longer. Um, but anyway, we'll, these are the things that we're going to do. And let's start right away with looking at a moral dilemma. Um, I want you to imagine that your friend has just come home from the hairdressers and she walks in and she says, what do you think? And you think, yuck. OK, you've got a problem, haven't you? What's, what's your problem? Manners. <laughs> Lack of. <laughs> right. Whether you tell the truth or not. Okay, but that's, that's not a problem because, I mean, we know we should tell the truth, shouldn't we? So it can't be that on its own that's the problem. OK, so if you tell her the truth, what are you not being? You, or what you fear you're not being is kind. OK, so we've got two rules, two, two rules that we like to obey in everyday life, don't we? Be truthful, be kind. And the problem with this situation is it looks as if we can't be both. It looks as if you've got to choose between honesty and kindness. And that's not a comfortable situation to be in, is it? Um, OK, moral dilemmas of this sort are common. And the reason they're common is that the rules of everyday life, like be kind, be generous, be truthful, whatever, are general rules that have to be applied in particular situations. And as a result of that, they come into conflict. Can you think of any more moral dilemmas? Can you think of any that you've come across, perhaps, in your everyday life? What about at school when a teacher pressed you up against the wall and said, who did that? What's your problem here? And you know, you know who did it. Well, you don't want to rat on your mates. You don't want to rat on your mates, exactly. So be loyal. Um, as in again to be polite to your teacher or be truthful or something. Again, it comes into conflict here. In all these situations, you've got a general rule that's come into conflict with another general rule because a particular situation brings them into conflict. Um, you might think that it's easy to get out of this particular dilemma. Um, one, I mean, let's have a straw poll. OK, so if you're in this situation, who would tell your friends that you think her hair looks terrible? Maybe not quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you would, OK, one, two, well, quite a few of you are putting up your hands. OK, who would be kind? <laughs> Most of you, OK, that, that's interesting. But you, you probably go, or at some time in your life, you will have gone through this sort of way of thinking. Well, sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. If you're kind to her, she might go around looking like that for the next six months, mightn't she? <laughs> And, and that would be to be cruel to her, because when she realised how awful she'd look, it's a bit like looking at those photographs of yourself in the 70s, isn't it? Ah! Um, and also, another thing you might try is, well, it's only a white lie if I tell her she looks fine. It's, it's not a black lie. I'm, I'm not doing it for bad reasons. I'm doing it for good reasons. So we, what we have to do here is that we um, are rationally required <coughs> by dilemmas like this to reflect on our values. We say, OK, what is truth? What is it to be honest? Or what is kindness? What is it to be kind? And if I were God, I would make sure there are as many moral dilemmas as possible, because I would want people to be asking themselves, well, how do I act in order to be kind? What do I need to do in order to be honest? Um, in this situation, being honest is difficult. Does that mean I ha uh, that is that an excuse not to be honest, etc.? All these things uh, are prompted 
um, are prompting us to think about our values and about what we should do in particular situations. But we yearn for these moral rules, don't we? Um, we, we yearn to, to have things like be truthful, be kind, be generous, be loyal, etc. because that, it makes life easy, doesn't it? It takes decisions away from us. And, and in this situation, a lot of people are tempted to make further rules. These are the sort of rules that they're tempted to make. So here's one. When kindness and honesty conflict, I'll always be honest. Now, I bet you know people who've made that rule for themselves. Do you? Yes, OK, lots of nods here. Or possible new rule too. When kindness and honesty conflict, I'll always be kind. Do you know anyone who's, who's living by that sort of rule? Yeah, I, again, lots of, lots of nods. What I say, in this case of the hair, you see, you wouldn't say, if you were a friend, you wouldn't say, oh, that's, you know, I like that. You would say, you could say, well, I'm afraid it doesn't, doesn't suit me, but maybe it doesn't suit my taste, but it maybe suit others, you know, you, you yes. moderate. OK, yeah. there, are, there are different ways in which you might be honest. I mean, nobody's... Well, actually, that's not true. I mean, very few people are going to actually say, but a few would say, yes. yuck. I mean, your 16-year-old son is not going to hold back. Uh, well, he might. <laughs> OK, but we yearn for moral rules, because moral rules make life easy. That's why we're tempted to make rules like the former two, um, which, which are not so obviously useful, actually. Um, but in this yearning for rules, we reveal ourselves to be moral generalists. OK, a moral generalist is someone who believes that morality is governed by rules. And one reason you might think this is people think of morality as, as principles, set of principles. And of course, what are principles but rules by which to guide us in our thoughts and in, in our actions? So if you think that morality is necessarily principled, and by that you mean that it's necessarily rule-governed, then you're a moral generalist. OK, but... Oh, right, OK, there's this little complication here. It doesn't matter how complicated the rules are that you think we're governed by. The fact is, if you think that morally we're governed by rules, then you are some sort of moral generalist. OK, particularist... Let me try that again, if I take a run at it. Particularists um, deny that moral reasoning is governed by rules of any kind. OK, Jonathan Dancy, here he is, uh, of Reading University, he's a particularist. So he doesn't think that moral rules... Uh, sorry, morality is governed by rules at all. We might have a look later and ask ourselves exactly what he means by that. But here's his argument for it. OK, he claims that all reasons for acting are context sensitive. OK, let's just have a, a quick look at reasons for acting. Um, I mean, when I um, ask you to pass me a pen, OK, your reason for acting is that you wanted to do what I wanted you to do, and you believed that passing me that pen would be um, a way of doing it. OK, so those were your reasons for acting. So whenever we act, actually, it's not always when we act, as we'll see next week, that we have reasons for acting. But um, when we act and we have reasons for acting, these reasons, says Dancy, are context sensitive. And what he means by that is that in some contexts, there are reasons for acting, and in other contexts, there are reasons against acting or their reasons for not acting, if you prefer. So let's have a look at an example for that. Imagine that your reason for refusing to perform action A, OK, that action might be passing me a pen, for example, but your reason for refusing to perform action A is that in performing action A, you would be telling a lie, OK? I'm not going to do that because it would be lying if I did that. That's a perfectly good reason for acting, isn't it? OK. Um, well, then ask yourself, does this mean that you should refuse to perform any and every act that has the property of being a lie-telling? Does it? So, OK, is it, 
Let me ask you two questions. Firstly, is it often the case with you that you don't act, you don't do something, because if you did it, it would be lying? OK, so it's a lie is sometimes a reason for you to act. Put your hand up. Or not to act, I should say. I'm going to assume you've all put your hand up here, um, even if I'm wrong. OK, so, so the fact that something has the property of being a lie, that an action has the property of being a lie, is sometimes at least reason for you to act, uh, or reason for you not to act. OK, but it doesn't mean that every time... Are there ever times when sometimes you think you ought to lie, that it's your moral duty to lie? Oh, Can anyone yes, give me an yes, example? Yes, yes. Somebody come, some people come after a friend who's taking refuge. Who they're, they're nice there. OK, yeah. so if the Nazis come to the door and they say, are there any Jews here? <laughs> you don't say, mm, yes, actually. <laughs> um, three of them under the bed. It, it, you think at that point that it's your moral duty yes. to lie. Yes. So it can't be the case that the, having the property of, of being a lie-telling is always a reason against an action. Fair enough? Or imagine that your reason for performing action B, for actually doing something this time, is that in performing action B, you would be keeping a promise. OK? So um, how many of you have done something because in doing it you would be keeping a promise? OK, so all of us act because we believe that keeping a promise is a good thing. But does this mean that we always keep promises? No. That we would perform and we believe that others should perform each and every action that would be a promise keeping? Do we? No. Well, can anyone give me an example, an, an imaginative example of... If you promise to take your children to the cinema and then... Uh, on the night your wife or rather sick and you have to take it to the doctor, then it's, um, yes, you have, to, you have to explain to them, and if they're very young, they may not even quite understand that. that uh, but it's, it's your moral duty. But there's one, <laughs> yes, it's, it's, a, it's a shame to break the promise and you have to make amends, etc. but there's a moral duty to do something else. Absolutely. So you promise to take your children to the cinema, but on the night your wife, your husband falls ill, and um, it's more important that you take them to hospital than that you keep that promise. Again, it seems that the fact that an action has the property of being a promise keeping isn't always and everywhere reason to perform that action. That's what Dancy means by reasons for acting are context sensitive. The context that you're in changes your reasons for acting. In some contexts, the fact that something's a lie is reason not to tell it. Uh, and in other contexts, that it's a lie isn't reason not to tell it. OK? Is that good? So that's Dancy's reason for being a particularist. Um, so Dancy believes that no reason for acting is always reason for or reason against performing an action. Every reason for action is context sensitive. Does he believe then that you don't use rules or it is that as far as he goes? Um, well, so he doesn't think that, um, well, I think actually I'm just about to say this, so let me check. Um, okay, so particularists believe that no moral rule is always and everywhere true. Particularists believe that moral rules like don't lie, keep promises, and so on are what philosophers call rules of thumb. Now, a rule of thumb is a rule that you use because it's useful, and it's useful most of the time, but it's not one that's unbreakable. If you come to a situation where it's clearly clear that this rule isn't going to be useful to follow, then, then you just don't follow it. Um, so... Or moral rules like the ones we've talked about, if they're rules of thumb, are not absolutely true. They're not moral absolutes. So don't lie is not always and everywhere true. I've this question that you just raised earlier on about context. Couldn't the Germans at Nuremberg have been justified by saying they followed orders because that was their context on that, on that, that example? Um, so the question is, were, wouldn't the Nazis have been justified in 
giving as a reason yep. that they were following orders. Um, well, presumably, Dancy would say no, because Dancy would think you should follow orders is a rule that in some contexts is true and in other contexts is false. Because he thinks that no moral rule is always and everywhere true. So you should follow orders or you should follow rules is not always and everywhere true. Yeah, I, I follow that rule, but, yeah. but the context would have been the um, Germanic um, war machine. And, and that, that means the, conte the, the context in which they were deciding, should I follow orders or not, was a context in which um, Dancy would say probably, or certainly I would say, that they shouldn't follow orders in this context, that the answer to this question in that context would be no. Whereas if you ordered me now to explain again what I meant by the, I, I might take that as something I should follow. Perhaps not. Time would matter. But how do you decide that context? It just seems another layer to me. No, but you don't decide a context. You're just in a context. So if, if you're, the Nazis are at the door, you, you know exactly. You, do, you don't, don't look so worriedly at me. Here you are all looking worried. <laughs> you make this sort of decision all the time. Whenever you face a moral dilemma, whenever your friend says, do you like it, and you think, yuck, that provides you with a context in which a moral decision must be made. And in that decision, in, in that particular decision one, there are two rules, be kind, be honest. And the question is, should you, in this context, follow that rule or that rule or neither? So you're all used to doing this. This isn't something, uh, all I'm doing is laying it out for you clearly as a philosopher should. Okay, now I'm going to take two more questions because I can see two more, but then I'm going to get on, okay? Could Dancy be described as a situationist, as described by Fletcher? I, I have heard people call particularists that. Um, I don't know enough about what being a situationalist is to be able to say for sure, but I, I suspect the answer is yes. to know how it differs if it does. It would be interesting to know how it differs if it does, but I, I suspect it doesn't, but I might be wrong. In this context, is it not a question of ranking priorities to attempt to, to, to act for the greater of two goods or the less evil of two evils? Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to postpone that question because um, I think I'm going to answer it later. Okay. So may I do that? Yeah. Um, but, but notice that the separate rules that I talked about people making, I'm always going to put kindness before honesty, or I'm always going to put honesty before kindness. That's another sort of rule, isn't it? And that's a rule that prioritizes other rules. So there are lots of different sorts of rules that we might look at. OK, let's, let's get on. Um, OK, I, I, just a show of hands. How many of you think you're particularists here? Oh, not everyone, but nearly everyone. I'm dying to ask why those who aren't particularists aren't, but uh, uh, never mind. We, we might come to the reasons why you're not in a minute. OK, I just want to point out that in talking about the things that we've been talking about for the last 10 minutes, we've been engaged in moral theorising. Now, that's a very different sort of activity from the activity that we're engaged in when we're actually trying to make decisions about how we should act. So when you're thinking, shall I be kind or shall I be honest, that's one type of thinking about morality. But when you're thinking things of the sort that we've been thinking, should we be generalists or particularists, or should we always follow moral rules or not, that's a different type of moral thinking. And moral theorising is called second-order moral thinking, whereas everyday decision-making about how we should act is called first-order moral thinking. And that's because moral theorising is thinking about our thinking about how we should act. OK, philosophers are good at this. <laughs> but do you see what I mean? We, when we think about whether to be kind or we're honest, we're thinking about how we should act and when we're asking, well, should we follow rules like sh sh we should be kind, we should be honest, we're thinking about our thinking about how we should act. With me? But is this not also creating a rule for something? 
Uh, no, I haven't created any. Oh, well, I'm creating rules, but not moral rules, about how to use language. I am saying you should use second order moral thinking for theorizing and first order moral thinking for, for thinking about your actions. Um, and that is making a rule, but it's not a moral rule, is it? It's a, it's a rule of language. OK. Some t it might become a moral rule if, if um, I think you're disobeying it. <laughs> OK. Can we sort these questions into either first order practical questions or second order theoretical questions? I'm going to give you a minute to think about it for yourself and then we'll go through it together. So don't yell out the answers, just think about them for yourself. Actually, you've only got 10 seconds, so you're not going to get very far. OK, is lying morally acceptable? Is that a first order or a second order question? Second. Second, second. second order. <laughs> so the first first. Order was let's, let's go over it again, shall we? <laughs> OK, first order moral thinking is, is asking about yourself about how you should act. Oh, I see. No. OK. The answer is, is... And so if you ask, is lying morally acceptable, aren't you saying to yourself, should I feel free to lie or not? That's first. Okay? But it could Does be it as if it's in a particular context. It's first order. No. It's second. You're now making me question it. <laughs> okay, shall we leave that one? I was going to call that one first order because I thought of it as, as being about actions. Yes. To the extent that it is about deciding how to act, it's a first order question. Yeah. Okay, what about should female circumcision be illegal? Could I know what female circumcision is? What do they remove? Oh, Erica. <laughs> no, I'm not, I, I absolutely refuse to explain that here. You don't answer that question. What about everyone else? Is that a first order question or a second order question? First. first. Whoa, we're nearly getting there, but. OK, uh, I think that's a first order question for the same reason. What about how can we know whether a given or that a given moral judgment is correct? Second, that's Second. you're getting, getting there. OK, could it uh, ever be right to kill an innocent human being? First, yeah. we are getting there, aren't we? Definitely. What makes a moral judgment right or wrong? Second, very much. You see, that's, you're not thinking at all about how to act, are you? What should I do? Um, you're asking here about, um, well, what is, here's a moral judgment. What makes it true or false? We're going to be asking this question in a minute. What's that? In that way, it's similar to, you, to the first item, which I morally accept. Well, no, because right or wrong here, um, actually, in fact, that's it's well right, pointed out. Yes, but what do I mean by right or wrong here? And I shouldn't have done this. This is a mistake that I've made. Can anyone point out what the mistake is? What should I have written here? True or false, actually, is what I meant. Do you, do you see what I mean? Um, so I, that question, I mean, you're, you're making me see that, that that was a bit of sloppy thinking on my part. So d if I can do it, that means you can do it very occasionally and not, cert certainly not beyond lecture three. Um, I should have asked there what makes a moral judgment true or false rather than right or wrong. By using right or wrong, I confused it with morality. I apologise. OK, what about this one? Is it wrong to kill embryos that have the genes for Huntington's disease? First order or second order? First order, well done. What sort of evidence can we give for saying that something's right or wrong? Second, good. OK. We need to work on that just a little bit, but only a little bit. If something is made but we're thinking about decisions on legality. So you're not just thinking yourself in the silence. Well done. Um, you're right to make the distinction between something's being immoral and something's being illegal. We're going to look at that in depth next week, so I won't look at it here. Um, but in order to make something illegal, we're usually asking whether either it's right or wrong, because we, we would only want to make illegal something that's not right, or it could be a matter of practicalities, couldn't it? I mean, we've either got to drive on the right or the left, 
doesn't matter which, it's certainly not a moral question. Um, not what? <laughs> this one disagrees with his French wife about that, for anyone who didn't hear, hear that. OK. Um, so that's, we, we started off looking at moral dilemmas, and I, I hope that what you've got from looking at moral dilemmas is that quite often in the particular situations in which we find ourselves, we find ourselves in a dilemma because we find that two moral rules, or possibly even more moral rules sometimes, come into conflict. We can't obey all of them, and therefore we have a dilemma. It looks as if we, it, I mean, it, it, it's a very difficult dilemma because both things seem to be right, and yet we can't do both of them. Um, so I hope that's shown us something about rules. It's shown the importance. Do it, are rules central to morality or not? But now let's look at moral truth. This is the second thing we were going to do. OK, c consider the following statements. The earth is elliptical. The t cat is tabby. These are straightforward, true or false. If you looked at my cat, Oedipus, and I said, is that cat tabby? You would say yes. Um, yes, you would say yes, I, I suspect. Um, OK, what makes those sentences true are facts about, in the first case, the earth and its shape, and in the second case, my cat um, and the fact that it's tabby. OK, d straightforward. In, in philosophy, we talk sometimes about the redundancy theory of truth. Because if you say the cat is tabby and the cat is tabby is true, in each case, you seem to be giving the same information. Because if you assert the cat is tabby, you are saying, in a way, the cat is tabby is true, aren't you? Yes. So, um, they're straightforwardly true. I mean, there are huge problems, I should say, with the redundancy theory of truth, so we won't get into that here. But, but just to point out that these are very straightforward. It, it even sounds rather silly when I say what makes it true that the cat is tabby is that the cat is tabby. Um, it's also scientifically um, verifiable. Um, yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, all sorts of things. I, I should just like to point out that um, the cat is tabby is true because the cat is tabby. Notice that here I'm, I'm quoting this, okay? I'm, I'm mentioning this sentence and I'm saying of it that it's true because of this fact obtaining. No quotation marks around this. So here I'm using the cat is tabby, and here I'm just mentioning it. Um, very important distinction that I'm sure is going to come up again sometime in these lectures. OK, but, but these are straightforwardly true or false, and the, the things that make them straightforwardly true or false are empirically verifiable facts. But if we look at statements such as it's wrong to kill human beings or we should always tell the truth, well, are there facts that make these statements true or false? And if there are, what sort of facts are they? OK, now, when I asked that first question, a lot of you shook your head. I said, are there facts that make these things true or false? And a lot of people went, no. OK, that's interesting. We've got a room full of moral skeptics, uh, or at least a few people. Um, it's certainly true, isn't it, that, that if there are facts that make these things true, they're not the sort of facts we can touch, look at, see, hear, um, put them in our pockets, we, nor can we conduct experiments to see whether it's true that lying is wrong or whatever it was that I used. Um, and so uh, some people think that this shows that there aren't moral facts, and, and a few people in this room obviously agree with them. So whereas the earth is elliptical or the cat is tabby, are, are actually they are true or false, and they're made true or false by facts, the thought is that things like lying is wrong, or you should tell the truth, or, or whatever. Um, they're not made true or false by facts,
so a question arises, are they true or false at all, perhaps? OK, well, if there are no moral facts, then perhaps moral statements are neither true nor false. Or perhaps we're free to decide for ourselves whether they're true or false. Perhaps it's just a matter of agreeing with each other that they should be true or false or something like that. Um, OK, a quick straw poll. Put your hands up if, if you think that there are no moral facts. No, don't shout out. Just put your hand up. OK, we, we've got a few moral sceptics and a few people who are waving at me and looking unsure. So I, I think that's fair enough. OK, if you'd like to learn more about that, we're not, we're not going to talk about moral scepticism anymore, at least in this session. We might do later in the series. Um, but here's a website that you might use to check up on it. And of course, you've got this written in your notes so you don't need to write it down um, and it'll be available um, with the podcast okay most moral philosophers or most philosophers believe that there are moral facts it is not the case that most philosophers are moral skeptics what sort of fact is a moral fact well here we are here are a few we're going to be looking in this series of lectures at four different theories about the sort of fact that makes a moral statement true or false. A virtue ethicist believes that an action is right if a virtuous person would perform it. So it's facts about who's virtuous and what they do that make true questions about right or wrong. So lying is wrong is true if a virtuous person would accept that lying is wrong and not lie, etc. OK, it's not a fact like the cats being tabby, is it? Well, you can't but it's still a fact, isn't it? Well, defining virtue. Oh, right? yes, defining virtue, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't worry, we're going to have great fun with these theories. We're going to devote a week to each of these theories, so we'll have plenty of time to talk about that. But I just want to point out that it's just possible that when you were thinking about the facts that make true or false moral statements, you might have been a bit parochial in your thinking about what a fact is. Because if you think a fact is the sort of thing you can see or touch or put into your pocket or... or that sort of thing, then, then you might have missed the fact that there are facts like this. OK, non-cognitivism says that an action is right if a person with a stable and general perspective would approve of it. OK, you might think that there's something rather similar here. Um, but OK, I, and again, you're thinking, I can see you thinking, what's the, what kind of fact is this? OK, we'll look at what kind of fact this is later in the series. Deontologists say that an action is right if it falls under a rule that prescribes it. So let's do a little bit of revision, OK? Um, I've given you two technical terms earlier today, um, and you can apply one of them to a deontologist. He thinks that an action is right if it falls under a rule that prescribes it. So a rule like um, keep promises or be kind. OK, is, is a deontologist a particularist or a generalist? Put up your hand if you think he's a particularist. OK, put up your hand if you think he's a generalist. Well done. OK, good. <laughs> We're getting the terminology right. A generalist is someone who believes that there are moral rules. A particularist is someone who believes that all moral reasons are context sensitive. OK, a utilitarian different sort of fact to make true a moral statement. He thinks that an action is right if it produces the greatest happiness to the greatest number. So telling that lie to the Nazis is the right action if it produces the greatest happiness to the greatest number. Well, there are facts about that. Let me ask you a question. Well, I'm sure I'll ask this again. Dropping the bomb on Hiroshima, was it the right thing to do or not? If you're a utilitarian, you think that it was the right thing if it produced more happiness than it um, took away, and that it wasn't the right thing if it did the opposite. Well, we don't know the fact of that matter, but there was a fact there, wasn't there? So there's a fact that's rather difficult, different from the sort of fact that makes Oedipus is a tabby true, but, but it's nevertheless a fact, isn't it? So four different accounts of the facts 
that make true moral statements. So anyone who adopts any of these moral theories is not a moral skeptic. They do think there are facts that make moral statements true, but they don't think the facts are necessarily um, facts that we can check empirically or that we can look at or whatever. OK. And this is good. We're, we're doing well here. I'm pleased that we've got this far in this session. OK. But this is the biggie. OK. Or, or I think it is in this. OK. There's one question. We're going to take one question before I go on to it. Is there another word you could use rather than fact? Because I, I would like to think of a fact as something that could be tested and proved to be true. And I would prefer to see another word used in place of fact in your second case. Uh, no, I absolutely refuse to change my language here uh, because fact is, is what I mean and I think you ought to change your view of what a fact is because um, does love exist? Yes. Yes, OK. Mo most of us here are, are romantics. We, we believe that love exists. Is this a fact... Is, sorry. Woo. Is this something that can be established empirically? Yes, I would say that. Well, actually, we, we could do. Perhaps we could. I mean, maybe I've just established that most people in this room believe that love exists, but of course they could all be wrong. No, but there's a way of, I'm sure there's a way of checking emotion, isn't there? Do you see what I mean? I, I do, yes, but I think you can have to persuade me. All right, here's another question then, just because I'm looking forward to persuading you of this. Um, do possibilities exist? OK, most people think, yes. Is this something that um, we can establish empirically? I, I would prefer yes. you said, do yes. probabilities yes. exist? I uh, no, uh, we're not talking about probabilities. We're talking about possibilities here. Can you, no, we, we, if you actualise a possibility, then what exists, of course, is an, actu uh, an actualised possibility, which is not, of course, a possibility at all. It is an actuality. What I'm asking you is whether, whether possibilities exist. Yes. yes. OK. Are, are the facts that make true this is possible an empirical fact? Yes. If, uh, I'm sorry, I should actually... I've, I've dug myself a terrible hole here, <laughs> and the reason I've dug myself a hole is I, I should have made a distinction between empirical possibility and logical possibility. And what I was actually asking about was logical possibilities. Um, if you like, we'll talk about that in question time. But I think, having dug myself a hole, I'm now going to <laughs> kick sand in it and move on quickly. OK, um, we're going to look at moral truth and whether it's absolute or relative. OK, firstly, I'm going to define both terms, because we need to know what we're talking about. OK, you're a moral absolutist if you believe that there's at least one moral statement that's true absolutely. OK, an example of that, here's a non-moral example of an absolute truth. The Earth is round. I should have said elliptical, shouldn't I? Anyway, just ignore that complication. The Earth is round, uh, is true everywhere for everyone at all times, irrespective of what people believe. OK, so even when everyone believed, for perfectly good reasons, that the Earth is flat. I mean, they are good reasons, aren't they? Look at it. Actually, this is a bad example, isn't it? The lecture room slopes. <laughs> um, even when everyone believed that the Earth was flat, they were wrong. The Earth was round then. OK? So that's a non-moral example of an absolute truth. And what makes it an absolute truth is it's true everywhere, for everyone, at all times, irrespective of, of what people believe. So you're a moral absolutist if you believe that there is at least one... Now, notice that at least one, you don't need more than one, you just need one moral statement that's true everywhere for everyone at all times and irrespective of what people believe. OK, that's what moral absolutism is. Let's have a look at moral relativism. You're a moral relativist if you believe that all moral statements are true or false only relative to something. Now, you might be thinking, what does this mean? Well, can anyone think of another example of an area of discourse 
okay, of language, where statements in that area of discourse are true only relative to something or other. There are some very, very common ones. Let's see if you can think of some. Put your thinking caps on. Uh, that's, that's quite a good one. Yes, the house is big, because big in relation to what? To other houses, presumably. It's not big in relation to um, a skyscraper. Yep, so, OK, that's, that's a good one. Any others? Someone's clever. That someone's clever, yes. Clever in relation to what? They might be clever in, in the domain of this classroom, but not clever outside this classroom or something like that. OK, can anyone think of a, a slightly different sort of example? Here's an obvious one. Your French wife, does she go to France often? Yes. And does she ring you up and tell you it's five o'clock? Rarely. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's say she, she does. Could, she, she could. And would you argue with her and say, no, it's not, it's six o'clock or four o'clock or whatever oh, it is? Well, actually, we do have an argument because I, I always insist on the time of the sun. <laughs> right. <laughs> OK, well, those of us who don't insist on the time of the sun, would they have a, would they have an argument with a French friend who told them it was five o'clock when looking at their watch in England, it was actually I never. Is it going to be four o'clock or six o'clock? Four o'clock. Thank you. Um, no, you wouldn't. Why wouldn't you? Because statements about time. So there's an area of discourse temporal statements, statements about time, where the truth of all those statements is relative to, and what it's relative to is a time zone, isn't it? OK? So, so we're, we are used to the idea of, the, of truth being relative to something or other. It happens often. And I'll give you a couple of other examples in a minute. But here are some non-moral examples of different types of relativism. Um, so you can believe that moral statements are true only relative to cultures. So, for example, here's a non-moral statement. A meal consists of meat and two veg. Well, in relation to my father's generation and culture, that was true. My father would certainly have believed that. Um, it, for him, it was true. My generation, not, not so much. I shouldn't think... There are many people in this room for whom that would still be true, but then it was true. Prayers are said five times a day. That's another non-moral statement that's false in our culture, but there are cultures in which it is true. So that's cultural relativism. So there are statements, the truth of which is are relative to cultures. Um, you can believe that moral statements are true only relative to individuals. So um, you, madam, what's your name? Yes, in the nice green. Civil. Civil. Yes. Do you like sardines? No. No? How can you not like sardines? Sardines <laughs> are delicious. I love sardines. So sardines are tasty is true for me and false for Sybil. Straightforward. We're, we're not going to argue about that because what makes it true that sardines are tasty for me is a personal preference, isn't it? What makes it false that sardines are tasty is true for Sybil is, is another personal preference. Sybil doesn't like sardi sardines. I do. So sardines are tasty is true for me and false for Sybil. Again, perfectly standard. But surely that's uh, not moral, whether you like... No, I said these are non-moral oh, oh, uh, examples. OK, so red is the most beautiful colour. What's your name? Fulker. Fulker. Yeah. OK. Do you like red best? No, not really. I'm very glad about that. <laughs> OK, like I do, oh, yes. Okay. So red is the most beautiful colour is true for me and false for Fulker. OK? Um, so again, now these are, are statements that are true relative to individuals and you're a moral relative or an individual moral relativist if you believe that moral statements are true only in relation to individuals. So abortion might be right for me but wrong for you, you might say. Or you can believe that moral statements are true only relative to situations. So lying is wrong is true in some contexts and false in others. I'm using context and situation there in, in, interchangeably, so that's perhaps reason to think that 
again, we, you were right to think they're the same thing. Um, but yes, it's cold here. Well, that might be true here, but not true where you are. Um, OK, so lots of different types of moral relativism. There are also different types of absolutism, but we haven't looked at any yet. We will in a minute. OK, let's do another little. Put up your hand if you're a moral relativist. Cool, lummy. <laughs> right, OK, that's nearly all of you. There are a couple who didn't have their hands up. That doesn't surprise me. OK, now I want to know why, please. Ooh, you've suddenly gone quiet. <laughs> to me, morals have nothing to do, well, they're separate from ethics. Anything moral is to do with custom, and therefore it's bound to be relative. Right, OK, there's Erica's answer. Does anyone else have an answer? What? I'm not a moral, moral relativist or a moral absolutist. Well, I'm certainly not a moral absolutist. Therefore, am I, therefore, by definition, a moral relativist? Um, good question, uh, and I'm going to give you two answers. The first one I'm going to give you now, um, and it's looking at the way I've defined it, which um, I said that an absolutist... Hang on. Yeah. I broke my thumb recently, and the one thing I can't do is turn pages. OK, an absolutist at least one moral statement is absolutely true. Relativist, all moral statements are true only relative to something or other. OK, so you tell me. Look at the logical words here. You're doing philosophy now, so you've got to look at the logical words. At least one and all. So you're an absolutist if you believe at least one moral statement is absolutely true. And you're a relativist if you believe that all moral statements are true only relative to something or other. So can you be both a moral absolutist and a relativist? No, not, not so far. We, we'll have a look later on at why it's so tempting to want to be, to say that you might be both. Um, it would be like saying everybody in this room is clever. And then later on I say, Volker isn't clever. Sorry, forgive me, Volker. <laughs> this is, um, OK, I've contradicted myself, haven't I? I must have done, because if all of you are P, then it can't be the case that one of you isn't P, can it? No. Right. Good. Let's establish that. Nothing like a bit of logic. <laughs> right, we still haven't got any answers from you, though. I'm just about to carry on moving. OK, wh wh why? Uh, come here, you're, all, you're all clear that you're moral relativists, so I want to know why. <laughs> because I can't think of, I can't think of one example. You, so it's a bit like atheism in a way. If you, you know, people fudge the issue by saying they're agnostic, but if, if you don't believe there's a God, but you think, well, there's some tiny possibility that there might be something like that, and you can still say, well, you know, I can't actually think of a, a God. God. <laughs> Right, OK. So you're arguing from exhaustion. You, you've had a look at all the moral statements you can think of in your mind. You can't see any of them that are absolutely true, and therefore you're inclined to think you're probably a relativist. None of them pass the test. None of them pass the test, OK. I, I should imagine that quite a few of you think exactly that. Any other arguments for moral relativism of some kind? Uh, generally... Good. You use the word instances. Would you change it for one of two other words that we've used in this context? I'm putting you on the spot here, and that's rather not very fair. Situations. Okay, situations or contexts, exactly so. So usually we'd say it's wrong to kill, but you can imagine you're saying contexts or situations in which it wouldn't be wrong to kill. And, and I think we probably could all imagine such situations. So do you see that um, you're, 
using Dancy's argument, actually, aren't you, to say that the, the rule, don't kill, is not a moral absolute. Good. OK, so you're going something for situation relativism, aren't you? Um, you're saying that um, moral rules are nowhere, always and everywhere true, because there are always situations in which they're false. OK? Um, it, it can't be both wrong and right to kill. Um, and if you're in a situation where it looks as if you ought to kill someone, it, it looks as if that's a situation where it's not wrong to kill that person, doesn't it? Um, well, if you, if you have... Um, where have I put my pen? We, we've often got different reasons for doing the same thing. Yeah, but, um, it's not right. but if if you say, okay, here, this is the class of actions that are killings. Yeah. Okay, each one of these is a killing. Yeah. Um, if you say all killings, all killing is wrong, then you're saying of each of those that it's wrong. Okay, then you come to this one, and you think, oh, actually, I ought to do this. Unless I kill Sybil, a bomb is going to go off that'll kill everybody in continuing education, or, or worse, everybody in Oxford University. I mean, obviously, she's got to go, hasn't she? <laughs> um, <laughs> do, doesn't this mean that, that even if all these are still wrong, this one is a killing that isn't wrong? Or... Is this right? OK, you, you wouldn't necessarily... Well, maybe you would say it was right. You could say that it, it's wrong... Well, we could actually use priorities here, couldn't we? Yeah, and it's what, what you described before um, as a consequence. More happiness for people, that was one, one of these... Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. It was more happiness. This is a consequence of what um, just happens if... Uh, well, it's true that no utilitarian is going to accept that. Yeah. Because a utilitarian won't, accept, because he would think that if a killing produced the greatest happiness of the greatest number, as, as I'm sorry, Sybil, this one would, um, then it wouldn't be wrong. Um, but I'm still, I, I think you could still think, uh, whether you can think something is wrong and still do it is a question that we're going to be looking at later in the, and still think you should do it, sorry, is a question we'll be looking at later. When we do what Kant. Makes the right? What makes right, even if there's reason to do Yes, <laughs> I'm not sure. Child incest as well. Child in incest, incest. Yes. yeah. And, you know, really horrendous paedophilia. I mean, that, that can't be ever... So you're inclined to absolutism. You, you think that... Yeah. You think that um, we shouldn't have sex with children is a moral absolute. Mm. Um, OK. I mean, there might be some people who are, who are inclined to agree with that. Um, but whether it's an absolute is... Another question. Word, One more, and then I'm moving on. The word usually that is important, isn't it? There has to be a rule. Well, usually... There can be a general rule, but uh, some well-argued reason for breaking that general rule. Well, uh, again, let's go back to the distinction I made earlier between a rule of thumb and an absolute. An absolute is a rule that is unbreakable. You don't break it in any situation. It holds in every situation. A rule of thumb is a... Sorry, this is my broken thumb. <laughs> a rule of thumb um, is one that, when you get to it, um, usually you would follow it. Maybe you would follow it every single time in your life, but you can imagine that a time would come when actually it wouldn't hold and when you should break it. And if you believe that, then you believe it's a rule of thumb, not, a, not an absolute. OK? So if you think you usually shouldn't kill people, then you don't think all killing is wrong. 
you're, you're not an absolutist about killing. You, you, you have a rule of thumb, or at least I hope you do, that killing is wrong. On the whole, you wouldn't kill anyone. But, but you can imagine a situation where maybe killing would be the right thing to do. Perhaps the civil one is the, <laughs> the one in point. OK, um, you still haven't given me many arguments, but luckily I prepared a few myself earlier. OK, here are some arguments for moral relativism. Um, some people believe that um, we should be relativists because all moral views should be respected. So if you believe that abortion is right and I believe that abortion is wrong, uh, I must respect your view and think that abortion is right for you and wrong for me. Um, so that's why we might be relativists. Or we might think, well, different people differ in their moral beliefs. So you think abortion is right. Sorry, this is getting to be a bit of a hackneyed example, isn't it? OK, you think killing is right and I think killing is wrong. And, you know, it's entirely up to you. So, you know, you, you carry on believing what you believe. So we become individual relativists at this point. Or we think that different cultures different, differ in their moral beliefs. So the Somalians, I understand, believe that female circumcision is right. Uh, in England, we tend not to think that. Um, but, but who are we to say that the Somalians are wrong? Uh, you, you know, they're right for them, we're right for us, and so on. And the last one that you did give me, um, different situation make different moral demands on us. So these are all arguments people have given me at different times for being moral relativists. Let's have a look at each of them. OK, the first argument is actually self-defeating. It's logically self-defeating. It tries to derive moral relativism from a moral absolute. So, for example, all moral truths should be respected. Therefore, moral relativism is true. I, you've got a problem here, haven't you? Because if you think of that as always and everywhere true, then that's false. And if you think of that as true, then that's not always and everywhere true, is it? So one or the other of those has to be false, and you've defeated yourself in this argument. This is, uh, you may have heard of a philosopher called Ber um, Bernard Williams. Um, he calls this vulgar relativism, and he has a very, very short, very pithy piece um, that if you want to read, email me and I'll pass it on to you. But it's, um, he calls it vulgar relativism. You cannot go from the belief that all moral beliefs should be respected or all, all moral truths should be respected. I should have put beliefs in there. That's really irritating. Uh, in all your out, um, handouts, would you cross that out and put beliefs rather than truths? Because I'm angry with myself for putting that there. Otherwise, it's, it is the argument known as moral vulgar relativism. OK, so that's the first, first argument. Here's the second argument. Um, different people differ in their moral beliefs. Well, yes, but this assimilates moral statements to statements of personal preference. So um, it was Sybil who doesn't like sardines, strangely, and I do. Um, you know, she has one personal preference, I have another. But if Sybil said to me, well, I don't, like I don't like kindness, I would think, eh? <laughs> uh, I'd think, oh, she, she's trying to be clever here, or something like that. I wouldn't actually believe her. Or if I did believe her, I'd shun her. And so would you. Because actually, morality matters to us far more, doesn't it, than whether people like sardines and so on. Volker, you and I may argue over the painting of a room, um, so you don't want it red, and I obviously do, it being the most beautiful colour. Um, but unless we're painting a room together, you're quite happy to let me have red as my favourite colour, I assume. Thank you. Um, the other thing is that if you say, um, well, OK, I think abortion's wrong, you think it's right. Um, actually, if I think abortion is wrong and you think it's right, your belief contradicts mine. They cannot both be true. Um, one or the other of them must be false. So uh, 
and, uh, I'm sorry, one or the other must be false unless we're going to relativize truth. But why should we relativize truth just because we don't want to say that other people are wrong? I and mean, isn't that again going back to, to this all moral views should be respected, all moral truths, sorry, beliefs should be respected? We'll have a look at that again in a minute. Presumably, it would be Just a quick impossible one. to run a society under this scheme. It, um, well, let me give you a good example of that, because I was just about to anyway. Tell me what would happen if you couldn't expect most people to tell the truth most of the time. What would happen chaos. if you couldn't think, OK, Erica says chaos. Why would it be chaos? If you couldn't expect most people to tell the truth most of the time, why would that be difficult? Why couldn't you run society? <laughs> Sorry, you're all shouting at once now. Uh, <laughs> did you? It would break down completely because, in fact, all insurances, even if you could put an insurance claim to the whole, the whole society, <laughs> would break down. It would break down, and it would break down because we couldn't trust each other. Um, so if I say to, what's your name? Jane. Jane, uh, what's on at the cinema tonight? And you say the King's Speech, and I think, oh, jolly good. And then I think, no, oh, hang on, do I trust Jane? <laughs> well, in the first case, if she's told me the truth, then I've saved my time and energy, haven't I? I don't, don't now have to look it up on the web myself. If I suddenly lose trust in her, I've actually wasted my time and energy by asking her, haven't I? There was no point in asking her, because if I can't trust what she says to me... And, and think about this as well. Lying is parasitic upon truth-telling. In order to lie successfully to you, I've got to get you to trust me, haven't I? It's absolutely essential that you believe me if I'm to lie successfully to you. So, if I'm a dishonest person, I'm not going to go around lying all the time. On the contrary, it's in my interest to tell the truth as much as I possibly can so that you build up a trust in me. The difference between someone who's dishonest and someone who's honest is that the dishonest person is constantly waiting for an opportunity where telling you something untrue would be of benefit to them and they won't be found out. That's the difference. <laughs> I, I, I didn't hear that, and I'm not going to ask for it to be repeated, but I'm sure it, I'm glad you all enjoyed it. Um, OK, so, yeah, the difference between a dishonest and an honest person is not that one tells the truth all the time and the other doesn't. I think that answers your question about that's why society. So personal preferences... Um, don't really matter. I mean, that's why we call them personal preferences. People are entitled to their own personal preferences. But morality really matters. Um, without people following rules like don't lie, don't kill, etc., we society would collapse. I mean, we still haven't said anything about whether they're absolutely true or, or only rules of thumb at that point, but the rules are necessary. Um, and also, it ignores the possibility of moral error. The fact that, you know, OK, Sybil's wrong to not like sardines, obviously. Um, and you might be wrong to think abortion <laughs> is right or is wrong or whatever it was. OK, let's look at the third argument, which um, different cultures differ in their moral belief. This ignores the possibility that different circumstances might generate different beliefs. Have we got any biologists in the audience? Not, not a one. OK, never mind. I don't think this question is going to be difficult for even non-biologists. If I have two genetically identical seeds and I put one in John Innes number three seed compost or whatever it is, and I water it just the right amount and I put it on my windowsill, but I shield it from the direct sunlight and so on. And the other one I stick in some garden soil and put in the airing cupboard and water it just enough to keep it alive, but I don't do anything else. Are they going to look very alike? after about six weeks? They're not going to look alike at all, are they? Does this stop them being genetically identical? No, no. no, of course it doesn't, because nature and nurture go together to make up what the plant looks like after um, six weeks. In the same way, you might have different circumstances. The Inuit, I believe, there was a time when they believed that their elderly should be gently put to death 
um, just allowed to slip under the ice. Um, well, we don't believe that. We keep ours alive as long as possible. You might think that we're wrong in this, but, but anyway. Um, perhaps if we lived where they lived, when they lived there, we would think that um, they were doing, that, that we should do what they do. In other words, we can understand what they're doing. Is there a, a, a higher order value, perhaps, that we can see the Inuit observing, that we too observe? Do you see what I mean? But in different circumstances, generate very different behaviours. So respect the elderly, perhaps, um, care for the elderly or whatever, might come out in two very different behaviours in very different circumstances. And again, the possibility of error is a problem. If you're going to say that the fact Somalians believe that female circumcision is acceptable and we believe it isn't, um, but they're right and we're right, so, you know, relativism holds. That means we can't turn around to a culture and say you're wrong. Um, because you can't, if, you can only be wrong within your own culture, okay? It makes no sense to say of another culture that it's wrong if cultural relativism holds. And just, there's another... The second and third arguments might rest on a confusion between P and believing P. And I do like to get logical blunders out of the way. So let me give you a demonstration. OK, what's your name? John. <laughs> the last two times I've asked who's called John and nobody has put their hand up. It's <laughs> sod's law that there should be a John sitting in the third row this time. OK, John believes that Marianne is wearing black. Is that true? Yes. OK. Notice that there's one sentence embedded in another sentence. OK. Marianne is wearing black is one sentence. That's the embedded sentence. And John believes that Marianne is wearing black is an embedding sentence. OK. And going back to look at facts that make it true, what's the fact that makes the, whole, the, the embedding sentence true? John believes that Marianne's wearing black. <laughs> well, uh, no, it, it's his belief. It's a fact about John, isn't it, that makes it true that John believes that Marianne's wearing black. We don't know what sort of fact it is. This is, this is difficult stuff, but it doesn't matter. We can just say it's because John believes that Marianne's wearing black that that sentence is true. What makes the embedded sentence true? Marianne is wearing black, as, as people said. OK, now let me ask you, could it, is it possible that that's true and that's false? Yes. Yes. Yeah, OK, John might have a false belief. It might actually be dark blue. Or, or it might be that the lighting's weird here or something like that. OK, could they both be false? Yeah. yeah. Maybe he does, hasn't formed any beliefs. He meant to come to this lecture, but actually didn't. So he hasn't formed any beliefs about what I'm wearing. Um, and I'm not wearing black because it's actually dark blue. OK, so they could both be false. Could they both be true? Yeah. Actually, that's probably the current situation, isn't it? It's true that John believes Marianne's wearing black, and it's also true that Marianne's wearing black. And now I can't remember which the fourth possibility is, but which is it? Um, that would be false, and that would be true. Yeah. OK, Could, is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. Of course it is, because John might not have come here today. He may have decided, and so he's formed no beliefs at all about what I'm wearing. Um, but it's still true that I'm wearing black. OK, so the important thing to realise is that the truth value of the embedded sentence and the embedding sentence value compl uh, sorry, vary completely independently of each other. Now let's have a look at... OK, if I say, if I now look, say, uh, Marianne is wearing black uh, is true for... John. OK, that's ambiguous. It could just mean John believes Marianne's wearing black, 
or it could be that Marianne's wearing black is true for him. I mean, actually, we, we don't like to think of that because whether I'm wearing black seems to be a, an objective fact about the world, not anything that could be made true by his believing it. But so P is morally acceptable for S is ambiguous. It could mean S believes P is morally acceptable or P is morally acceptable for S. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. Mugging elderly ladies is morally acceptable for Fred. OK, that could mean Fred believes that mugging elderly ladies is morally acceptable. Or it could mean that mugging elderly ladies is morally acceptable for Fred. Now, the first of these, Fred believes that mugging elderly ladies is morally acceptable. Well, that's unremarkable, isn't it? I mean, poor old Fred may have had the sort of upbringing in which he ended up believing that. Um, we might want to put him in prison because of it, but we're not going to deny that he believes it. The fact that he's been out doing it every night for the last three weeks shows that he believes it. So this is, this is not, re not remarkable at all. But mugging elderly ladies is morally acceptable for Fred. Well, this is individual relativism. OK, this is a completely different kettle of fish. If we believe this and Fred mugs an elderly lady in front of us, this means we've got to stand back because even if mugging elderly ladies is morally acceptable, for, uh, unacceptable rather for us, for Fred, it's morally acceptable. So just as I won't engage Sybil in arguments about whether sardines are tasty, because I'm quite happy to say that they're tasty for me but not tasty for you, if mugging elderly ladies is OK for you but not for me, and I accept that, then if you go and mug an elderly lady, I'm supposed to stand back and say, I wouldn't do it, but for him, it's fine. That's what I meant about it doesn't take account of moral error. If you're an individual relativist, you believe the truth of mugging elderly ladies is OK. The truth of mugging elderly ladies is OK is relative to individuals. So it might be true for you, for me and false for you. And that's how it is. Not, not just you believe it's OK. It is OK. Very different kettle of fish. Now, I think. I had another example. No, I didn't. The other example I was going to use was a cultural one. It was the Aztecs believe, for, for the Aztecs, killing children is morally acceptable. OK, does this mean that the Aztecs believe that killing children is morally acceptable? Or does it mean that killing children is morally acceptable for the Aztecs? Surely it only means the first. It doesn't mean the second. It doesn't mean that they were OK to kill children when they did it. It just meant that they believed, which is nothing very interesting. Um, well, I'm sorry, it is, it is interesting, if, especially if you're archaeologists and so on, uh, anthropologists. So uh, what I'm asking is, should we believe that mugging elderly ladies is morally acceptable for Fred simply because we believe that Fred believes that mugging elderly ladies is morally acceptable? Blindingly, obviously, we shouldn't. Instead, we should say Fred is wrong. This is the argument we can then make against stoning adulterers. Um, we can certainly say that stoning adulterers is wrong, you mean? Yes. Yes, absolutely. We, we don't say stoning adulterers, you know, well, you believe stoning adulterers is OK. We don't believe stoning adulterers is OK. But morality is culturally relative, so that's OK. You carry on, mate. Cultures believe that it's acceptable to stone adulterers. But I, I guess most of us here wouldn't. And I, I've always found it difficult to make that argument. But this is, this is the argument you now can make against that. Well, um, perhaps I'll come back to what you're saying later on. We're actually running out of time. Let me move on. But I, but I think I will address that. Just want to move on. We've looked at the first three arguments for moral relativism. Um, now let's look at the fourth. Do you remember that was different situations make different demands? The fourth argument assumes that the only form of moral absolutism on offer is what I'm going to call lower order absolutism. And here, the only form candidates for moral absolutes are 
everyday, whoops, everyday moral rules like don't lie, tell the truth, etc. Um, actually, there are three types of absolutism, so-called lower, lower order absolutism, higher order and token absolutism. Let's have a look at them. OK, that, I think that's fairly straightforward. OK, here's higher order absolutism. Oops. Yes, OK, if you're a particularist, you deny lower order moral absolutism. You don't think that things like don't lie, keep promises are everywhere and always true. You think they're rules of thumb. OK, higher order absolutism is the belief that moral absolutes are rules like this produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. That's the utilitarian rule. Or treat others as ends in themselves. That's the deontological moral rule. We'll be looking at both of these later on. But can you see these are completely different sorts of moral rules? And whereas don't lie, keep promises are very good school rules, aren't they? These are lousy school rules. I mean, you wouldn't have those up in the hall saying everyone's got to obey those because you'd have everyone going, eh? <laughs> Um, as somebody said earlier, in connection to virtue theory, well, what is a virtuous person? What well, you is might the ask. Second one unsuitable for a school, treat others as ends in themselves. Well, because there's, there are not many 11 year olds who would know yeah, what it would well, be to be an end in themselves. Age range, it? I mean, yes, but you don't want to set rules that are only going to be obeyed or understood no, but, by the sixth well, formers. Use that language, but I mean, the, the, the meaning is. Anyway, the, the higher order absolutism is the belief that these are moral absolutes. And token absolutism is the belief that moral absolutes are imperatives about token actions. OK, type token distinction. If I wrote, wrote on the board, let me do it. Where's my pen? the name of a well-known pop group, well-known to anyone of our age anyway. <laughs> um, I apologise to <laughs> anyone who's younger. Um, OK, how many uh, letters have I written down here? You could answer four, or you could answer two. And if you answer four, you're looking at token letters. And if you answer two, you're looking at type letters. OK, uh, I, pinched that I pinched that example from um, Peter Millikan, by the way, um, another famous philosopher at Oxford University. OK, you can do it like this, too. I'm a token human being. OK, there's a type of thing, a human being. I'm a token, you're a token, you're a token, you're a token. OK, there are lots of chairs in this room that, that, that are all of a type, but that's a token one of those chairs, OK? So you can be a token absolutist. It would be wrong to tell that lie, you might think. Or you must keep that promise. So you're not an absolutist about all lies. But when it comes to a particular lie, you are. So let's, let's move on. Higher order absolutism and token absolutism go together. If it's absolutely true that we ought to produce the greatest happiness to the greatest number or treat others as ends, then it's going to be absolutely true in any given situation that we should perform whichever action produces the greatest happiness to the greatest number or treats others as ends. So the Nazis are at the door. Where are the Jews, they say? Um, you could tell them where the Jews are, but you think, actually, my aim, my job, is to produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number. In this situation, it will only produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number, if I say there aren't any Jews here. So telling that lie, there aren't any Jews here, at this occasion, in this context, in this situation, is the right thing to do. Do you see what I mean? Higher order absolutism and token absolutism go together, um, even if don't lie is nothing more than a rule of thumb. Um, and higher order absolutism and token absolutism together may explain, firstly, why lower order rules are not absolutely true, and also why lower order rules are important. Here's the first one. 
Low order rules are not absolutely true because if telling a lie in a given situation wouldn't promote the greatest happiness, the greatest number, um, or respect others as ends, then we ought not to tell it. But if it would promote the greatest happiness, the greatest number, or respect others as ends, then we ought to tell it. So why is don't lie nothing more than a rule of thumb? OK, why is it sometimes true and sometimes not true? Answer, because the thing that's always and everywhere true is we should produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number. And sometimes, or mostly, lying doesn't produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number. But in this situation, it does. Therefore, we should tell this lie. So, so higher order absolutism plus token absolutism explain why lower order absolutism is false. Um, and lower order rules are important because if we see many situations in which token lies are absolutely wrong, OK, so mostly lying is wrong, isn't it? Um, and only a few where they're absolutely right, then don't lie becomes a useful rule of thumb, doesn't it? And where we go wrong is in thinking that it's absolutely true, not in thinking that it's generally true, usually true, that that is true. Sorry. And another reason we might think of lower order rules as important is that when we were children, we were all taught lower order moral rules as if they were absolutes. Tell me why. It makes life easy, doesn't it? And uh, it's, we don't say, darling, you know, what you've got to do is produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number. What we've got to do, darling, don't tell lies. And of course, when your child catches you lying uh, the first time and says, mummy, you just lied. Um, at that point, you sort of backpedal, don't you? Quite quickly. And, and you explain to the child that lower order moral rules are da 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 da. So, um, our discovery that the rules we were taught as absolutes aren't absolutes causes us to think that the standard view, the knee jerk view, the view of authority, if you like, is that the lower order moral rules are absolutes rather than just that. That's what we were taught when we were children, um, for, for obvious and very good reasons. So not only might we be absolutists while accepting that lower order moral rules are not absolutely true, we also might think that absolutism explains why lower order moral rules are not absolutely true. Um, at this point, we've got five minutes left, and I'm quite tempted to just finish there and have five minutes for question. What I was going to go on to do is, is um, distinguish two different types of absolutism from different types of relativism. And then I was going to um, give what I think is a psychological process by which people come to um, believe that they're relativists. Um, but. I can do that, or I can have a question and answer session. Who would like the question and answer session? D do put your hands up. Don't be, or just signal to me like that if you don't want to put your hands up. Okay, who would like me to go on? Oh right, I'll go on then, even though I can hardly speak anymore. <laughs> right. Uh, it would bring the greatest happiness to the greatest number. Okay. It's important to distinguish token absolutism from both individual relativism and situation relativism. OK, what do I mean by that? Let's have a look. And instantly, I just want to say, if your mind is buzzing now, yes. for a start, it's not buzzing any more than mine is. <laughs> and secondly, that's entirely to be expected. I can't teach you these things. All I can do is put them in front of you. You've now got to go home and do the thinking for yourself. OK, you've got to go back, have a look at your notes, think about what I've said, and see why what I've said makes sense. You might disagree with what I've said, and that's absolutely fine. But, but you need to go away and do the thinking for yourself before you're in a position to see whether you agree with me or not. But let's, have, let's distinguish these things. OK, mugging Mabel Smith at 5.30 on Tuesday, the 6th of December 9, 2009, was wrong. That's a token moral statement. It's a moral statement about a token action. See what I mean? 
Um, token absolutism says, if this statement is true, it's true absolutely. Okay? Anyone who thinks it's false is wrong. Okay? So, so if you believe that, you believe it as an absolutist. Okay? A situation, uh, sorry, an individual relativist believes that even if this statement is true, it's only true in relation to individuals. So there might be people, Fred, for example, for whom it's false. And this doesn't just mean that there are people who believe it's false, but that there are people for whom it is false. Perhaps the person who mugged Mabel Smith did da 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 Maybe we should let him off. Because if we accept individual relativism, then it wasn't wrong for him to do it. And what right have we got to punish him for, for something that wasn't wrong? So that's token absolutism. That's individual relativism. Don't confuse the two, because if you do, you'll, you might think that you're an individual relativist, whereas what you actually are is a token absolutist. And of course, it's very important, as you know, to get these things right. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing, it's huge. <laughs> okay. Distinguishing token absolutism from situation relativism. Token absolutism claims that lower order moral rules are only rules of thumb. Okay? So lying is wrong, perfectly good rule. It's one that I use myself all the time. If I see an action, I see it's a lie. I, I, I am inclined to think it's wrong because I think that most lies are wrong. Um, so, as a token absolutist, if I am, I'm not telling you that, I'm just putting it to you, um, there are only rules of thumb, so even if most lies are wrong, there can be token lies, perhaps that the Jews are not here, um, that are right. Situation relativism claims that lower order moral rules are true only in relation to situations. So in situation S, lying is wrong, whereas in situation S star, lying isn't wrong. It's actually difficult to know what that means. Does that mean you can tell any lie you like in situation S? Here's a situation that is characterised by the fact that lying in this situation isn't wrong. It isn't that lying to say that the Nazis, that, sorry, the Jews aren't here isn't wrong. It's to say lying isn't wrong in this situation. Something odd there, isn't there? Again, I'll leave you to, to think about that. Here's the process. Now you're getting very jerky about your parking meter, aren't you? I'll try and move quickly. OK, I think that our knee-jerk moral relativism is a combination of several of the er errors that we've examined and often the result of the following process. This is the process, and I'm going to go through it, so I'm not going to give you time to read that, but I am going to go discuss each of those briefly. Right, abortion is wrong is controversial, isn't it? I mean, we all accept that this is... Uh, some people believe this, some people don't believe this, and so on. Best explanation, I believe, of this is that abortion is wrong is a rule of thumb. OK, it's generated by beliefs about whether pr abortion promotes the greatest happiness, greatest number, or treats others as ends, and so on, um, and so on. But, but the fact is, it is controversial. Some people believe it, some people don't. You might think, well, actually, nobody needs to believe it as an absolute. Perhaps we can all believe it as a, as a rule of thumb. Um, anyway, respect for each other leads to reluctance to disagree. Oh, dear, Sybil thinks that abortion is wrong, and I think it's right. Um, but dear old Sybil, she's a nice old bat. I, uh, <laughs> sorry, that's what I used to call my mum. <laughs> <laughs> it was meant very affectionately. <laughs> um, well, hang on a second. We're, what we've got here, what seems to be vulgar relativism, because actually I don't think that disagreeing with somebody is a sign of respect. If you say P and I believe not P, actually I, I show my respect for you by saying, oh, that's interesting. You believe P, I believe not P. Maybe I'm wrong. Why do you believe P? Tell me your reasons, and I'll tell you my reasons for believing not P, and maybe we'll both discover that we're wrong. Or maybe we'll discover that you are right and I am wrong. Or, or maybe the, So uh, how can it possibly be disrespectful to disagree with someone? It may be disrespectful. We may agree with them in a way that disrespects them, 
But it doesn't disrespect somebody just to disagree with them, does it? Um, so I, that's the second move in the process. The third one is that, OK, having done this, having said, well, I respect Sybil, therefore I'm not going to argue with her, uh, abortion must be right for you and wrong for me. Or the other way around. I can't remember what I said before, but it doesn't matter. So here, can you see that the logical blunder threatens? Now I, I'm thinking that, well, OK, Sybil believes that abortion is wrong. I believe that abortion is right. But that's merely a statement about what we believe, not about the truth of our beliefs. So why do we go the extra step and, and in doing so, become individual relativists? Third move, we accept lower order relativism. OK, abortion is wrong is true only relative to individuals. Um, OK, so, so we go from the unremarkable belief that I believe abortion is wrong, you believe abortion is right, to the relativistic belief abortion is wrong for you and abortion is right for me. And actually, if you think about it, both of these are hugely controversial because even if I accept that abortion is uh, right for me, um, I would certainly think that there are times when it wasn't right. If I, if I choose to have an abortion at eight and a half months because I want to go on holiday... You know, is, is abortion right for me then? Well, surely not. Um, it, it seems as wrong for me then and as I would think it is for, or Sybil might think it is for other people. And we might then go from lower order moral relativism to the belief that all moral truth is relative, either because we're ignorant of or because we're ignoring the possibility of higher order or token relativism. So do you see what I've done is I've taken us from a, through a, a psychological process by several quite easy and easily explained steps by how we get to beliefs in relativism that are actually not justified at all. Now, this is not to say, and I think I've finished that, OK, we'll come back to that in a minute. This is not to say that moral relativism can't be a much more sophisticated position that has a fighting chance of being right. I mean, I don't think it's right, but then that's me. And, but there are other good philosophers who think that moral relativism is true, but not in these crude forms. OK? What I want you to do, if you can, if you've got time, if you haven't, it doesn't matter, go home, look at your handout, work through what I've said, and, and see if you can see where the errors come in. That'll do you, that's all you need to do. OK, I'd just like to take a straw poll here, because half the room, actually well over half the room, said that they were relativists. Who now thinks they're a relativist? <laughs> Oh, goodness, still, still quite a lot of people. OK, I, I think I might ask that question again at the beginning of next week. Uh, there's the reading for next week's... Oh, this is for this week's lecture. OK? Um, uh, it's, yes, it is. Yep, yep. And if you'd like to test your understanding, ask yourself whether you can do those questions. OK? Uh, and if you'd like to do some reading for next week, there's... A lecture, uh, some reading for next week. That's it. Thank and you. thank you for listening. I'm sorry, we. Haven't...